Our next speakers are Pat and Elena Kilner. They are both natives of the Washington area. I've already told you where Elena went, went to school. They met when they were eight years old, but decorously waited to start dating until they were 23. So <laughs> thank you for that beautiful example. <laughs> Uh, they've been married for 18 years and have eight children, ranging from 17 to three. So I was thinking about the speakers lined up for today's conference, and it's, it's a more experienced group generally. But I, was, I thought, gee, you know, it's nice that we have somebody who's in the thick of it, because I think the Kilners are the definition of the family in the thick of it. Uh, and look, here they are. It's amazing. <laughs> Pat has a uh, real estate business in, in the area and is very active in volunteering at his alma mater, the Height School, which inexplicably does not have a display here. I don't know. <laughs> Pat. <laughs> uh, Elena has been primarily a homemaker and has dabbled in homeschooling and writing. How do you, well, maybe we'll hear how you dabble in homeschooling. And she looks forward to being more involved with her alma mater, Oakcrest, as the children get older. Pat and Elena are going to talk to us about what has worked for us to foster a family culture. I'm going to go first so that I actually get a chance to talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Over 60 years ago, a sailor who was married and had six kids did something many would call drastic. He decided he didn't want to be away from his family for six months out of the year, so he quit his job packed up his family, his whole life, and moved everyone to Panama, where he could have a job piloting ships on the Panama Canal um, and could be more present at home. What my grandfather did made a huge impression on my, on my, my own father, um, his son, who was in eighth grade at the time, um, and, and it really, it impacted his decisions about his career, turning down um, attractive possibilities that would require substantial travel. And now that decision has impacted my own children and how we raise our kids. Today is an opportunity for us to think deeply about the impact that our decisions have on the health of our families. Um, we may not decide to quit our jobs and move to another country, but we are called to have the courage to question social norms or even just personal habits uh, that make uh, it more difficult to raise our families in keeping with our values. When we talk about family culture, um, I want to unpack just a little bit of what we're actually talking about. Um, and I'm going to do that by reading you a few questions that maybe we can think about how they apply to our own families. What activities are so a part of the life of my family that they are given? Why are those activities so important? How? Does my family mark milestones and special occasions? How does my family deal with adversity? What does the word leisure mean to my family? What does the word work mean to my family? The answer to these questions will vary greatly um, with every family, and that's good, it should. Right, um, But regardless of how we answer them, um, I think two things we're going to find um, hold true. 
First, um, as we strive to form our family's culture, we have to be intentional. It's really easy to do what's expected by our schools, by our coaches, by work, even our peers, and end up frittering away precious time that is critical for developing our family identity. Second, um, there's no such thing as neutral activities. Everything we choose to incorporate on our family plate um, is going to influence the culture. You can think of family culture as a gourmet dish, and every ingredient serves to either perfect that dish or drag it down. There's nothing neutral. Um, the big question we, we really want to address is how does our family life serve as a vehicle for forming my children in virtue? Jim Stenson, a well-known author and educator, said that children develop character by what they see, what they hear, and what they are repeatedly led to do. This is exactly what we're doing when we set out to establish our family culture. We are the primary educators of our children precisely because we are communicating what is most important by how our families live their lives. Uh, Blessed Alvaro Del Portillo wrote in a letter in 1994, he said, tomorrow's society will mirror today's families. And I might be so bold as to add that the character of tomorrow's families will mirror the character of today's parents. Um, before we talk about the different ways to form our family culture, I'd like to talk about three principles um, that are really tools for us as parents that are indispensable as we set out to form our family life and decide what our culture is going to be. So the first of these principles is that we need to be examined souls. Um, when my oldest was just a couple of years old, um, I used to like to watch him play. Uh, he had a great imagination and I'd like to eavesdrop. And there was one day where he was marching around the dining room table saying something very enthusiastically fists clenched and just very determined. And I got, as I got a little closer just to hear what he was saying, to my dismay, I realized he was saying a four-letter word <laughs> that started with D and ended with N. Um, and I'm ashamed to admit that it was not very hard to figure out where he had learned that word. Um, even if they don't admit it, uh, our kids are imitating us, and if they aren't actively imitating us, they're watching closely and taking notes. And if we are not setting an example of struggling for virtue, they won't either. Um, we need to examine ourselves, not only for the sake of them not picking up our vices, but so that they do pick up on the importance of accepting that our weaknesses are not the status quo, that we can change, right? Um, as rapidly as our families are changing, also, it takes daily assessment to stay on track and on that critical part of being intentional um, in, in shaping our family culture. The second principle or tool that we need as parents is to be unplugged. And I know we've all heard that. Um, we, a lot of times I think we, we hear about being unplugged for our kids. Um, and I think it's possibly even more important for us to be unplugged as parents. Um, several years ago, one of my kids came up to me uh, and asked, Mom, why are you always on the computer? And I had to honestly assess how much time I was spending on social media. I think it's really easy for, um, for moms of little kids to get in a mode where they feel like they can't be super productive when you have a lot of babies and toddlers. Um, and the quick default is to check your phone or check the computer and then it quickly becomes an addiction, as we all know. Um, 
but I imagine that at the end of the world, it will be incredible to see how many opportunities we have missed to connect with the people right in front of us because we were distracted by forms of technology. Um, I am going to go ahead and just tell you, this, this is more um, our prescription that we use at our house for technology. Um, and this applies to the kids, um, and we try to stick to it ourselves as well. Um, so our high schoolers um, have phones with no internet access. Um, and they still have friends, I promise. <laughs> um, all of the computers um, and devices are in public areas of our house. Um, the TVs and computers are absolutely off limits in private bedrooms. Um, we disable the internet whenever we, the parents, are not in the house and at night when we're asleep. School papers are written offline, um, and we don't have cable television. The only TV watching happens through streaming, which we control. Um, you don't have to do it that way, but that's what, that's what has worked for us as far as really um, allowing everyone in the house to be present to each other and really using the technology as the tool that it was meant to be and not the trap, right? Um, the third principle or tool that I would like to, to offer is um, that we as parents are united. It is so important to work together as husband and wife in developing the tone of the home. In order to do this, we need consistent time together alone. Um, one of my favorite quotes from one of these conferences, Father Scalia was here and he gave advice he said, the best thing you can tell your kids is to go away. <laughs> I love that. Um, but, um, you know, we do this, we've done this, and it's had many various iterations over time. Um, it changes with our changing family, right? Um, but I can tell you, you know, some of the things that we've done at various points We've done things like after dinner, Pat and I will go off to a separate room and the kids know that it's off limits and we just would have our tea or coffee and just download from the day. Um, we, there were times, there are times still where we go into phases of going for, you know, walks around the neighborhood every night, that type of thing, especially when it's nicer weather, right? Um, there were times where we were able to, when all of the kids were in school, go for a weekly lunch date. Um, and now we have a standing weekly date night. And it, it doesn't have to be um, you know, anything fancy or expensive. Um, doesn't even have to mean a sitter. I mean, we've had third wheels on our date nights you know, when necessary. Um, but it you know, it's, can be as simple as ordering takeout and having a glass of wine and shunning the other kids to another room while they watch a, a movie or whatever it is, or they play games or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but to have that consistent time um, is so important where you can count on it because you get in the habit of going deep and talking about, um, you know, what the various kids are struggling with, who needs what, or even the funny stories that maybe one or the other has missed from the week, right? Um, but you start planning your um, family life based on a joint understanding of what the family's needs are. Um, so those are the three, what I would say, kind of foundational tools that are great to have in the tool belt as parents, and I think Pat's going to take it from here. All right, so she's been preparing that for like three months, and I just figured out that I had this talk three days ago, so you can all go to sleep now. Um, <clears throat> you all have on your, uh, on your tables, we put together a little, uh, just a, a sheet, two-sided sheet, and on it is just some suggestions 
One side is, here are things that may impact your family culture. And this, this came up, uh, it was a list of, that we started spitballing at a date night. And you know, what are all the things that, that could impact our family culture and that we've talked about over the years? So we've given you that just as sort of a, a point of reference. What I'd like for you to do, many of you, uh, of you are here with your spouses, is grab a piece of paper, there's, there's a little um, pad, um, you know, distribute a piece of paper, and as I'm talking, think about which one of these, or if there's something else, that's an area that you as a, as a couple want to address related to your family culture, and pass it to your spouse. So each of you get, will, will have a piece of paper that says, here's the area that we want to talk to each other about related to our family culture. Maximum three. Maximum three. Start there. So, you have that. By the way, yeah, take, I, I, we, didn't, we didn't print out enough for everybody, so take a, take a quick photo. The other side of the paper is for you to, is for you to take back with you and just some, some ideas to consider around building family culture. Now, so many of you, I have learned from in this room what family culture means. It's a very humbling thing for Elena and I to, to be asked to speak to you about this. Um, but that's, that's, so that's what that is. And, and want you to just consider this deeply because the cost to society of us, of us not getting our family culture, I think Father really eloquently spoke to this, is massive. The ripple effect of, of our family cultures on the world 100 years from now could be absolutely enormous, enormous and, and culture changing. So I think we can agree that family culture is roughly the means through which we infuse our children with certain values. And that's the business that we're in as parents. We're in the culture business. We're in the virtue-infusing business. Now, the difficulty of this type of talk, we were actually given the, the name of this talk, we didn't come up with this on our own, is that it's self-referential. And there are few things that I like to do less than that. But um, we're going we're gonna to speak to some models of how, we how we've begun thinking about family culture Take what you like, throw out what you don't. Your family culture should fit you like a glove. Your, your, your job as, as the parents, as husband and wife, is to, is to forge a culture that fits really uniquely to your family, your children, and to each other. There's no cookie cutter franchise model out there for this. Um, there's no... Culture is not a vestment that you just put on and take off. It's something that's deeply integrated. So, as I said, my, my goal today is to give you some insights into some of the conversations that we've had around family culture. Before I jump into those, those paradigms for a second, I want to make three really important points. Father touched on a couple of these. The first is that what is really clear is that in the absence of a purposeful family culture, there will be a culture that, that exists. And so there is no, no such thing as not being on offense if you want to win this game of having a, a really strong family culture. Second, dads, and I'm so glad Father mentioned what he did. This, I think we, we inherently understand this. If, dads, you're not all in in forging family culture with your wife, it's very likely that your children will never have or lose the faith that they have. And then thirdly, and this came from another uh, one of our, our dates, I asked Elena, you know, what, what is our vision for our kids? What is our vision for family culture? Because culture necessitates that we have a vision for the type of men and women that we're raising. And so... There are children now, maybe, but you know, who are they going to become? For us, here's our vision, for what it's worth. They are men and women open to God's prompting in their life. They're men and women beyond reproach. They're men and women who can lead the church. 
These are men and women wise as serpents and humble as doves. Men and women who know how to sacrifice themselves for others and embrace the cross as only sons and daughters of Christ can. And they're men and women who know the joy of being sons and daughters of God. So that's our vision. What's yours? So as I promised, I want to I wanna take these three paradigms. And we just extracted three pieces from the, that list that I think all of us have to deal with, have to grapple with in some way, shape, or form. And again, this is what worked for us. Um, and it may not be exactly what works for you. But I want to, to w- just walk through the thought process around this. There's three questions that I think you could ask of any of the things on this list that you've now hopefully handed to your spouse. The first is, what's the challenge? What challenge am I facing? What is my biggest obstacle to living out this attribute that we want to infuse into our families? The second is, what's my vision? What's the most important thing to impart to our children in this way? And what virtues will this fortify the most? And the third is, what's the handcrafted model that we as parents are going to give to our children of this ideal? So, I'm going to take three. One is sport, because I just like sports. Two is work, because we all have to work. And three is leisure, how we're spending our time in leisure. So, sport start with the best. Okay, what's the challenge? So the challenge for us, again, maybe different for you, the challenge for us is that I really like sports and travel sports seem to be really fun and exciting. Travel sports are expensive, they're year-round, they take up massive times of, massive amounts of time on weekends. Rec sports are a really poor substitute for competitive sports. They're very weak, like, they just don't work. But we want our kids to seek excellence. So like, on the one hand, rec sports aren't gonna do that. On the other hand, I may lose my family if I spend this much time, like for us, right? This is just, it's, it's obsessive. So we've got these two things. Those are the two business models out there, it seems for raising kids who are athletes, who understand good use of of their physical attributes. Okay, what's the vision? Vision of virtue. Okay, why do sports exist? Toughness. I want my kids to be tough. I want my girls to be strong. I want my boys to be protectors. Working as a team. Performing under pressure. Appreciation for physical gifts. Strength to defend others. Development of courage, of fortitude, of justice. All of these can come through the vehicle of sport. Okay, so if that's the problem and we have a vision for where we want to go, what's our solution? Because the two solutions out there for us just haven't worked well. Handcrafted model for us. Um, I, this has actually been really kind of cool. Over the last week, my two oldest boys who do not wrestle year-round, made nationals. So I've got a junior and a, and, a, and a freshman. They both made nationals. Every kid that they're wrestling against in, in the national tournament has, wrestles year-round, has cauliflower ear, you know, like, um, and, and just they're, they're, they're amazing. And these two boys have not. We've just used a different business model to get to the same place. Um, They both wrestled in nationals yesterday, and my oldest was still alive, right, in the bracket. He could have kept going. Um, But he had a trip to the Holy Land, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And um, I'm driving him to the airport yesterday. I was like, buddy, I'm really sorry that you can't complete this. You know, you were still doing well. And he goes, Dad, there's some things that are more important than wrestling. I was like, okay. (laughs) Maybe for you. But how do our kids understand the purpose of sport as well? 
we, we have to present a different model. So how does it fit like a glove for you? For us, it's been, we've got a mat in the basement and you're blessed to have a, a sibling within 10 pounds of you who also likes the same sport. Um, we have also encouraged a multi-sport philosophy in our, in our household. So in terms of physical, and there's a lot of studies on, on overuse of certain muscles and this sort of thing, and, and kids having injury and this sort of thing. Um, so we've just encouraged this multi-sport philosophy. Hey, big picture, like, look, the chances of you all going pro is pretty low. The chances of you dying are pretty high. So we want you to get to heaven, and sport is a vehicle for that. And actually talking to the kids about that. At eighth grade, I have a talk with the kids about them owning their sport. I don't own your sport or your success in this sport. You own your success in this sport. It's yours. I love you. If you tell me it's an important thing to show up to, I'll be there if I can. But your ownership of the sport, we oftentimes see parents who want to own the sport more than, more than their kids, living vicariously through their kids' success. That is not part of our family culture either. Um, we also made a decision to move as close to the school, the heights, as we could, in part because by being that close, our boys could participate in as many athletic opportunities as possible, as well as other great opportunities. So that's, that's sort of our, our understanding of sort of the, the physical good that sport can be. We also have a mini CrossFit gym in our garage um, that I work out with my kids in. And that, in, its, in and of itself, is, has been a really, really great blessing. It sort of came out of COVID, um, and we had all the kids at home. And um, I, I, have this, I had this great upbringing where I got to see my father's physical strength because he was swinging a hammer, and I was on job sites with him. And I think there's something, too, especially for boys, seeing... Um, that even though they're growing into themselves, they're not quite where dad is yet. Um, and, and, there is, and there is a real beauty to, to helping my girls become stronger as well in this way. And so, so often I th we, we don't actually see our, our parents physically toil for much of anything. For us, I don't, I don't have the luxury of being able to go build a deck with my kids every weekend, but we can do this. So... That's, that's what's worked for us. So challenge, vision of virtue, and handcrafted model. Second, work. What's the challenge? The challenge is, well, a few things. It's easy to feel like you need to work constantly in this area to provide for a growing family. For me, I've definitely been tempted to say, I'm just going to keep working because hang, hanging out with toddlers right now is the last thing I want to do if I'm totally honest. And I, lo I love little kids. I love them. But I don't want them hanging out um, all the time with me. My work, as I mentioned before, is not naturally given to involving the children in. And if you think about, that's, that's a relatively new idea. Pre-industrial revolution, your kids were working with you a lot. And so what, we're, we're really grappling with this, this new idea. And work, the, the family business, was the school of virtue or a big part of the school of virtue for our, for our families. That is not the case anymore for the great majority of us. So how to, I've really grappled with how to, how to deal with this compartmentalization of the nature of work. Here's the vision of virtue. One, for us, work is a school of virtue for the kids. Okay, how do we do that? Two, skills of entrepreneurship are important to, to our minds, the discovery of vocation. You, you, it's hard to, being an entrepreneur is really about dealing with adversity and figuring out what the next step is to go forward. That's what is necessitated in vocation, and that's how we express it. Entrepreneurship is intimately linked with this idea of vocation and in our home. Work is at the service of the family, not just a monetary idea. 
work displays our virtues in action in a very unique way. And then finally, work is or should be prayer at its highest ideal. Okay, so that's the, ver- that, that's the vision, big lofty idea. What's the handcrafted model? Very quickly, um, and we, you know, this could be something we, we talked about for, for ages, but some ideas. One, at every opportunity that we have around the house, we are trying to work on the house with the kids. So we put a basement, um, uh, you know, basement bathroom downstairs with, with, with the boys, and that's where our stinky high school boys live now, and that's where they shower, and it's great. But they actually help me build the rooms downstairs in order to do that. I happen to know what to do with, with tools because of my father. Um, putting up the fence, we get a nice big yard and, and we have coyotes in our, that, that actually occasionally invade our backyard. Well, we also have babies running around the backyard and those may, may, might not be, you know, totally compatible. So the big boys built a fence um, and that was one of their projects. And they actually put the fence in um, and I went around and started shaking the posts and they weren't anchored correctly. So I had them take all the posts out and they redug the holes and they had to re-pour the, the concrete and, and they did it right the second time. Um, those types of projects where they get to see the physical nature of work d- directly translating into, into something good for the family. But work is about prov- provision and the earlier you can give that to your older kids, the better. So just being opportunists in what needs to be done around the house can be really helpful. All of our kids have chores, little jobs, daily responsibilities. Just it's how the train runs on time around our house. Um, sometimes it runs smoother than others. My office happens to be in the house. My primary office happens to be in the house. Now, post-COVID, that's actually more of a, there, there's more of an opportunity to do that than ever. And while my kids can't always help me at what I'm doing, they can see my prioritization of them versus work. And that has, and I think for me, it's been grappling with, you know, working deeply and in a focused way, but also allowing the little ones. Little ones have no boundaries. And so they know how to open doors now. And, and they will occasionally just come into, into my workspace. Um, and you know, how, do you, how do you handle that has been a great struggle and a great thing for me. And then finally, um, my older kids have begun interning with me. I have, have my own company. And so uh, we, I've, I've really brought them in and giving them discrete projects to work on in not just hanging out with me, but actually, hey, I need you to own this piece and go do this. Now come back. Okay, we're going to talk about you know, I, you know, these things that maybe you need to brush up on a little bit. Um, I've also, with my older kids, it's a very practical thing. Um, as they begin interning with me, I have them take... Um, Dr. Kevin Majors has a, has a program called Optimal Work. And Optimal Work is a tremendous program that teaches... Adults, really, really designed. It was designed originally for kids at Harvard to work better and with more focus. Absolutely phenomenal, and um, it's not too early to start that with some of your high school kids as well. So that's work. Final leisure. Tom, how am I doing on time? How am I doing? Awesome. So leisure. Last one for today. What's the challenge? Challenge is busyness. There's a culture of spending money to have enjoyment, I think especially in affluent areas like ours. And there's a culture of individualism in leisure, video games, me time, this sort of stuff. So those are the challenges. We could list tons of other challenges when it comes to leisure. What's the vision of virtue for leisure? Slow down. Again, this is ours. Slow down to be present to one another and deepen the foundations of friendship. First, within the family, and then with those around us. Leisure is a time to develop talents for us. The idea of wasting time in our talents is some of the, some of the greatest memories that we have. And prayer is best done in silence. And leisure should promote prayer 
because of the silence of the home, which can be difficult with like a three-year-old, but he goes to bed eventually as well. Handcrafted model. What does this look like for us? Um, I had the luxury of spending three years of my life in Spain for my graduate work, and so I brought some of, some of Spain back to our house, and so we have a little bit of Spanish culture. Um, Elena, each year, um, began a tradition, and now friends sometimes um, join into this tradition, which is awesome. Any of you can do this, by the way, for me. This is fine. Um, we have a jamón serrano. If you don't know it, look it up, and you can send it to me. Um, that sits in our house. And as soon as I begin sharpening the knives to begin to cut the jamón, the little ones come. They hear the sound of the knives being sharpened, and they come, and I just drop little, you know, uh, bits of, of ham, and they just keep, they're like little birds. It's great. And, um, and it's a forced way, it's a forced slowdown for me. One, because you'll cut off your hand if you go too fast. But also just because the kids are around, and you get to spend that time. Um, I've also, uh, I, I cook paella. Cooking paella and doing it right is at least a two-hour idea. And, and that's awesome. And for me, that forces slowdown, that forces family time, and the, the conversations that we have, oh, yeah, open that bottle of wine, give that to your mom. All of that happens as a result of food in our family. And I'm sure you have some of that as well. My mom's side is Italian. The Italians know how to do this really well. The Irish, not so much, but the, the Italians really good. <laughs> but you can learn. We also have a culture of singing together. Um, our kids will sing as they do the dishes, um, whether to you know, what's on Pandora or, or just together. And, um, and that's been really just beautiful. Um, we've got a few kids who play play instruments. And so sometimes they'll go a cappella, sometimes it's, it's playing instruments. That's become, you don't get that unless you just have time to waste. Because it goes from the work that the family's doing together into let's retire and let's go spend this time. Um, and some of our greatest, greatest family harmonies, if you will, have come as a result of, of singing together. And not everybody sings very well, necessarily. It's just that you are together singing. For us, Family Rosary has been an anchor for our evenings since we got married. At first, it was just the two of us. We put the little ones down, breathe, bring Our Lady into the picture here. And now, by the way, it's not, it's not for us. It's not like, hey, you've got to be here for Family Rosary every night. It's awesome to see our high schoolers putting down their work and coming out from their bedrooms or from their, from their study and saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to spend this 15 minutes with mom and dad, bringing my day to, to Our Lady. So family rosary has been, very much become part of our family leisure time. Um, I like to, as often as possible, oftentimes weekly, do a one-on-one -on -one hike with my kids. Just get out. We are, you know, Great Falls or, you know, there's gr lots of great trails. Something about walking with my kids causes them to speak to me. In particular with my boys. My, my, my oldest daughter, maybe we can sit face to face, have a cup of coffee, and she's like, oh, I can't wait to download. That does not work with my boys as much. They have to be moving and maybe not looking, looking at me immediately. So just different, different paradigms to get the kids to talk, just get the kids to waste time with me in that way. And then, as Elena mentioned, weekly date nights. These are some of the things that are our handcrafted model to leisure and to modeling that leisure for the kids. I'll conclude with saying this. It seems to me that culture is passed down through story. And I think the questions we have to ask ourselves is what story, what lore are our kids becoming part of? What will they tell their children? What would their children's children tell of you and your family life? What will impact your family culture and the culture at large? Thank you.